where probably the people will come will understand actually the situation of indigenous peoples. And that uh, although we'll be coming from a, like a problem, problem orientation, this the group here would be able to understand why. Uh, and so we appreciate very much what, uh, uh, the invitation to come here. Um, when we look at the situation of indigenous peoples, you will immediately see the link between the human dignity, uh, the, the lack of human dignity, and the humiliation that they are suffering currently. And to start off, we would like first that we have like more or less a formal definition of indigenous peoples. And this definition actually came out of the study of Jose Martinez Coco uh, on uh, the discrimination against indigenous peoples, uh, there is no definition, formal definition of indigenous peoples uh, uh, that is acceptable to everyone. So what we have is just like a criteria or a characterization. And most importantly is that there is a link between history, territory, peoples, and the future. So if you look at here, we talk about historical continuity, okay? with pre-colonization and pre-colonial societies. That is rooted in us territory, so developed within their territory. And these peoples consider themselves distinct, okay, from other sectors of society. And they form a non-dominant section also of the population. And that they are determined to pass on to the future generation who they are, what they are, what and also their own territory. But more importantly, they also self-identify as indigenous and also that others may recognize them as such. Um, if you ask us, are you indigenous? Uh, indigenous is an English term, right? We usually refer to ourselves based on what we call ourselves. And most of us actually like are related to certain feature, natural features or like a river, a mountain top, a, a, form, a certain formation in the landscape, or even uh, plants, animals that are found in our environment. So if you study, I'm sure that those who have studied a lot about peoples in, in, in different countries we realize that this is how we usually also identify ourselves. Uh, we, one of the big problems that we have in really looking at the situation of indigenous peoples in Asia and probably other in the rest of the world is that uh, in terms of formal identification of even the ethnicities of peoples in the, uh, in, in the different uh, nation states, no? the census that are being conducted are usually ethnic blind. And in many nation states, in many states, they will even not want to, to uh, what is, identify different ethnicities because they're afraid that it is like divisive. This argument is usually you find it, especially in the mega region, unfortunately. So what we did was look at different studies look at different studies, but then we only deal with a Southeast Asia. No? This is just a sample of Southeast Asia. Uh, and look at what were the, like the main, what was the, in different studies, so these are from government, government documents, from NGOs, from research institutions, no? and all the, 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 what is this, the, the, the censuses or in the population, uh, uh, statistics are all different, so we just had a, like a minimum and a maximum. So this is what we are, and in the main, indigenous peoples are uh, a are, are minority in the different countries in Southeast Asia. Oh yeah, sorry you cannot see it, but uh, you can go to our website and you will see the bigger picture there. I hope that it's... I think for filming it's okay. So I just okay, yeah, and uh, okay. Some of the common features of indigenous peoples in Asia, of 
course, we have these things to lifestyles, languages, cultures, traditions, yeah? uh, even social political institutions and governance systems. And in, in, in many of the, of the uh, tourism paraphernalia of government, you will always see the proud uh, uh, what is this, the statements that, oh, we are a multicultural, multi ethnic community, and please come, no, 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 you know, the variety that and we offer you with all these different costumes, especially with the women, they're very colorful. Yeah? Okay? So that's the indigenous peoples actually provide that diversity in the cultures, in the, you know, in the peoples that are here. Also, we have a strong collective identity and self-ascription is rooted in our territory. As I said, the struggle of indigenous peoples now is being, is to be able to be in their indigenous territories. Yeah? This is the only home that we know, that they know. This is the only place that they know, and it is uh, also the place which gives them identity. Third is that in many states, they are referred to by many names, ethnic minorities, hill tribes, India, you have the Adivashi, tribals, tribe, uh, ethnic nationalities, uh, ethnic group, so many. Uh, but if we subject them to the criteria that we have earlier, then they have a right to self, is, uh, self uh, describe themselves as indigenous peoples. And now it's, it's, it's important that their territories are rich in natural resources. This is important to state because many of the of the struggles now of indigenous peoples are rooted actually on the defense of the territory because of the, um, the drive to extract uh, wealth from those territories. Okay. Now, what are the key issues that we are facing? First is the legal recognition in national laws and legislations and the continuing violation of our rights to lands, territories, and resources and livelihood support in basic social services, that means government neglect, and climate change impacts and solutions. Okay? Now, let's look at some of this. And uh, for legal recognition as distinct peoples with these uh, collective rights, I, uh, there are several um, countries which have legislation that um, refer to indigenous peoples. For instance, in the Philippines, Nepal, Cambodia, Malaysia, and Japan. Japan uh, recognizes could I know as a like a cultural group. Am I right? Yeah. But not as peoples, in distinct peoples with rights. And in Malaysia there is now a very big debate and also um, an, an attempt to weaken actually the uh, the for instance, it's related to called the National Customary Land Rights. Yeah? So it is land rights in prefer and uh, this is a claim that indigenous peoples can, can uh, use, but not as distinct peoples with collective rights again. So that's why the asterisks are there. And ethnic minorities and hill tribes, this is uh, usually used here in the Mekong. So you have Vietnam, Laos, uh, Myanmar, Thailand, and China. Uh, using this in Bangladesh, we also uh, call them primitive uh, peoples, primitive groups. You know? And at the, uh, at the international level, some governments, when they make their statements, they usually claim that all of our citizens are indigenous. And you will hear that from Indonesia, Malaysia, India, Bangladesh, and Thailand. Okay. Now, um, there is, that's why uh, we see that in the in Indonesia, there is a degree of recognition of the rights of masyarakat, the indigenous people who live by customary, and these are the indigenous peoples. There is a con uh, contradiction there because at the international level, they will say, no, we are all indigenous. Yeah. And then um, all of the Asian state except Bangladesh actually voted in favor of the UN Declaration on the Rights of Indigenous Peoples. Yeah. And this non-recognition of indigenous peoples with collective rights actually is the root cause of the many problems.
problems that we are facing now in the different countries. Yeah? And thus, there are also the gaps between laws and policies and, its in, and their implementation. Now, in terms of continuing violation of rights to land, territories, and resources, uh, you will know, for instance, uh, in, 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 in Sarawak now, there's a big movement against dams, the construction of dams. In, in, in Cambodia, we are now receiving a lot, almost every week, of the indigenous communities rising up against the economic land concessions. And then, um, which usually tries to affect people. In, uh, in, in uh, for instance, the Philippines, uh, indigenous peoples are fighting against mining operations. Um, and uh, we also have, we are also affected by the, uh, uh, the ASEAN um, Economic Community 2015, you know, this is being like, oh, it's a very welcome, a very welcome development in the region because we have an integrated uh, economic system, but actually if you look at closely, the, the how this is going to be achieved is mostly building on, I mean, extracting the resources of uh, the, the different, different ASEAN member states and where are these located? Most of these resources are located in indigenous people's territories. So you have the ASEAN Free Trade Agreements, investment plans, now the ASEAN and uh, the Asian highway from, from uh, India to, uh, to China, no? from the Indian Ocean to the Pacific Ocean. And that cuts across so many of the indigenous territories. We have palm oil, we have talked about that biofuel, commercial agriculture, rubber oil, uh, palm oil, rubber, uh, and other um, corn, um, all usually to be used for biofuels. And of course, real estate development and commercial tourism. And uh, we know that so many, for instance, of the indigenous peoples here in Thailand are being displaced because of uh, tourism uh, initiative, I mean, uh, investments. Okay, so you have there mines, dams, and power projects, economic land concessions, as examples, and also the demarcation of territories as national parks. This is a very big problem in Thailand, uh, in, 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 basically in the Mekong, because many of the territories are, have been declared as national parks. And many of the, this, the countries which have these so called national parks actually look at this as conservation areas. No people, this is the model that is here. No people. But if you look at all of this, why are, why are these conserved? Because there were people. These people were in the entire indigenous peoples. Okay? And this has something to do, for instance, with, you know, the, the life, the very life of the people, the dignity of the people. They, they get their food, they live sustainably in those areas. They are self-sufficient to a certain degree. They don't have to beg, they don't have to have cash to be able to eat. They have better nutrition because they have variety of foods. They have better health because they are more, uh, you know, they have a, a, a healthier environment. They are more connected to nature. They have better water without the pollution. But now, these are challenged. And then, in terms of the protection of traditional knowledge and biodiversity, the indigenous peoples have a lot of knowledge of preserving, conserving, propagating biodiversity. But that these are not recognized actually in the discussions on, uh, you know, uh, on sustainable development, on biological resources. So these are all threats, not only to the food security of indigenous peoples, but actually to the lives of indigenous peoples. Okay, livelihood support and basic social services. I think I don't have to go through this, but you know, uh, we know that the, if, if you look at the reports, so many reports, indigenous peoples are, are the lowest rung of the development ladder. They are the poorest of the poor, they are the most illiterate, they have, you know, the, 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 they have bad health, they have the least access to justice, and the offer of, eco of economic development to indigenous peoples is jobs. Many indigenous peoples are not familiar with being paid to enter in the job market, the, the labor market. And of course, we know that these jobs are not sustainable. 
And so many of them are asserting that we would rather have food than cash because cash may not be able to provide our food. Um, now, China claims in play change impacts and solutions. Uh, so many of the discussions now is just something it, it, it's like indigenous peoples are actually contributing to climate, uh, climate change, uh, to negative effects of climate change. They are deforesting the forest, they are, you know, uh, so no more water, etc., etc. But actually, there is a need to revisit that one because what actually, they are contributing actually to the uh, mitigating uh, uh, climate change. Uh, for instance, in, especially in, the, in terms of their lifestyles and traditional occupations. So here, uh, I reiterate the recognition of traditional occupations and the non-recognition of the contributions such as indigenous peoples to uh, natural resource management so the solution to climate change. And then, of course, uh, indigenous peoples are not consulted on how this uh, mitigation and adaptation, adaptation uh, measures are being being uh, done. Okay, and there is no support actually for them to be able to continue to contribute to uh, climate change mitigation and adaptation. Now, the challenges for indigenous peoples. Okay, because we, it seems that you know. Uh, uh, the feeling of many indigenous communities are they are under attack. And there is a need to strengthen actually their indigenous social political institutions, their governance systems, their economic, their economic systems. No? And so uh, for us to think about this so that we probably can take it on in our advocacies and contribute to studies that will make sure that uh, you know the contributions of indigenous peoples are, are reflected in the different discussions that are going on globally on many of the issues that is affecting humanity like climate change, diseases, uh, you know, conservation, uh, uh, human rights, okay? So we need to build the capacities of indigenous institutions, organizations and communities because these changes are becoming fast. There are no time actually, um, so much um, so much is being done, but there's so little time to cope. And we face this actually, for instance, in the main demands for uh, what are we, how are we going to do with the, the company is already here, it is already bulldozing our lands. Yeah? Uh, so we need uh, to build the capacity. What we are doing is to build the capacities of our uh, partners and members um, to be able, first, to be aware of their human rights, second, is to be able to monitor, document and record and report the human rights violations in, in, what, in, in whatever level, from local to international, in the different human rights mechanisms. And also we need to uh, in, in, <coughs> increase the um, participation, visibility, voice, space for indigenous women and youth in the decision-making processes, both at the internal level, this within the indigenous community, and also at the more formal levels. And then uh, oh, these are just um, uh, examples of actions that are being taken by indigenous peoples. Indigenous peoples are now more organized. Many of them are already taking actions. This is demonstrations against the rape. Uh, in, in Bangladesh, so many indigenous women are being raped uh, in, the, in the indigenous communities. And these are, and, and this is taking a, like, a, or this is a, a tension between uh, Bengali sectors and indigenous peoples. This usually, almost all the rapes, all the rapes that are recorded actually are perpetrated against indigenous women by Bengali sectors. Um, and this one is, you know, there you can see their FPIC free prior informed consent. This is in relation to a uh, uh, a dam in, in Nepal, which is actually uh, supported by the World Bank. And then uh, this one is uh, a land grab in, uh, in uh, Jharkhand state. You can see the women already uh, trying to uh, uh, carry symbols of protest. Uh, okay, second 
way that we can support and strengthen indigenous peoples and communities is to strengthen solidarity and, co and cooperation among indigenous peoples themselves at different levels, but also to develop meaningful engagements among civil society and states, okay, so that the rights, especially the collective rights of indigenous peoples, are respected and that we promote sustainable development, what we call self-determined development. Okay. And we would like also to reiterate that actually at the at the international level, the indigenous peoples have gained a lot. So they have gained space in the United Nations, for instance. We have, of course, the adoption of the UN Declaration on the right of Rights of Indigenous Peoples, the UN RIP. Uh, also, that there are mechanisms that have been established, like the UN Permanent Forum on Indigenous Issues, the Expert Mechanism on Indigenous Peoples, and the UN Special Rapporteur on Indigenous Peoples' Rights. Uh, just recently, the, the Special Rapporteur on Indigenous Peoples' Rights, Peoples Rights was um, with the, the, the President of the Human Rights Council uh, endorsed actually of uh, uh, Filipina yeah uh, so we have a nation there city and opportunities okay I'd like to present this because there is this itself is a very good opportunity for us there is an increasing opportunity interest for uh, by other stakeholders to look into the situation of indigenous peoples yeah and at different levels, they also are looking at youth, it's specific, you not know, targeting youth, focusing on indigenous youth, indigenous women, you know, lifestyles, and so there is an increasing interest. And also there is an increasing space for indigenous peoples at various levels. Certain local governments provide, uh, for instance, uh, a representation of indigenous uh, peoples in their uh, local decision, uh, in their local, local legislature legislative body. Like in the Philippines, even at the lowest political political unit, the representation of indigenous peoples is assured, okay, up to the provincial level. Now, that's my sharing. I wanted to keep it short because uh, I know that there's a lot of contributions that are going to be shared in this, in this room, and I know that a lot of you are working also in, uh, in this uh, in this area so uh, thank you and I also want to hear your voices thank you This for your wow, wonderful presentation. I guess that some of you may have questions or something to discuss with Bernice. So we still have time, right? So just raise your hand and then ask her about that or discuss or share with us some of the thought. Question that come to mind is in the wake of the AEC, I mean, uh, what are some of the, the main issues, the main changes that are going to be um, impacted? How, how will Indigenous people be impacted? I mean, beyond the obvious, what are some of the really major things that, that might happen in 2015? You know? Actually, we do not look at the AEC as if it's going to happen in 2015, and many things will happen. Way, way back, they are already happening. All, the, I think, the, to me, the AEC is just like a time frame for government. But actually, all the preparations for this, all the efforts towards this has already been done. For instance, investments have been uh, is it, liberalized. Yeah. So governments have actually aligned their laws so that there is freer investment. And most of these are into extractive industries. For instance, the, the, the ASEAN has this mineral, it's a mineral plant, something like that. And where are the minerals? So this is already ongoing. They will just, 
you know, it's just a harmonization. The, the Asian highway, highway, where does it pass through? For instance, if you look at the, um, what is this, what is happening in, in Cambodia, in the rail, the railway and the highway, that is part of the Asian highway. Uh, the pipeline, for instance, of uh, Kaladan, no? that is going actually to, you know, that, that's as part of it. But for instance, the ports that are being constructed in, 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 in Myanmar, no? these, are, these are part of all of this. Um, so most of these are extracted. Um, and uh, that's, that's the, the, the worrying thing is really uh, investments are coming in both domestic and international and, 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 and uh, international into countries that are now making it easy to invest in so many areas. An example is in Cambodia, no? many of the companies that have this economic transition are actually Japanese, Chinese, and of course the, the local states. But these are, these are already big plays. These are already so we see that there is a, a worsening condition now when all countries will have to liberalize their investment uh, laws so that it will accommodate uh, freer uh, entry of investment, uh, lower taxes, and then freer access actually to the different resources in the countries. Does that satisfy you? Thank you for your work. Uh, I have a question. Uh, basically, my question is, when I work with indigenous communities in the Amazon, they are facing these situations. And in order to address that, the first step is to become an entity, like a non-profit, so to speak, like a community. My question is, uh, are these indigenous populations organizing, becoming a community in that sense, legalized in that sense? And then after that, are you looking for international lawyers in order to represent these different communities in order to speak about that they are not in agreement? Because usually what we have is these people be protesters, rebellion, and that's the work we need to really organize. Thank you for your question. Yeah, there are different uh, what is approaches, no? In communities where there's a strong, the strong traditional governance system is in place, the, the, the indigenous social political institutions are still strong. They can act as a community. And different states uh, countries have different uh, what is this, laws governing um, organizations. Because, for instance, in the Philippines, we don't need to be registered to be able to act, to speak. But in Cambodia, you should you have this 13 step thing in order, no, not 13 step, several steps to be able to register, to be able to register as a community organization. The thing is, this is defined by law. This does not reflect the, 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 the formation, the, the traditional formation of the community. You know, they should have bylaws, blah, 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 blah. No? And the Bible should contain this one. It does not look at the, what is the governance system there, what are the rules to marry laws, blah. It does not. So, there are different degrees and some uh, and, and, uh, different ways of coping. For instance, in Cambodia, they really have to go through this process because it all, uh, through this process, they can then apply, go to the next step, and uh, apply for collective land title, which is in the law. But in the Philippines, we have a law which is, says that you can apply for a, says, a certificate of ancestral domain title, which is another thing. And you don't have to be registered. So, so these are different formations, yeah, and they are reflected in the membership of AIPP. So, the the yeah. So, in terms of speak, uh, bringing this out, you know, 
we also have different ways. Of course, at the community level, they are they can demonstrate. At the international level, they can demonstrate. But also, we submit complaints to the to the Princess and National Human Rights Commission. We submit complaints to the to the court. We we uh, also uh, submit. Uh, communications to the special rapporteur and the rights of indigenous peoples. We next week is the eighth, every year AIPP convenes the Asia Preparatory Meeting on UN mechanisms and other relevant procedures and processes. And here several delegations from the different uh, countries in in Asia in in Asia as we define it in the AIPP, not in the far for the Middle East, we're going to uh, And these uh, representatives now discuss how are we going to, what are our um, lobby points in the UNPF, I mean, side events, what are the lobby points that we have in the, in the uh, expert mechanism, uh, in the Human Rights Council. Now, the World Conference of Indigenous Peoples is happening in September, so how are we going to deal with this? Blah, blah, blah. So that is how we are uh, we are bringing our voices from the lower level to the I mean not lower level from different levels. Yeah. Is that does that satisfy you? Uh, when I work with indigenous, uh, one of the things we see is it's very important to help them to own the process. Okay. And then uh, they, they they will maybe they didn't know how to write, but they will we will write it. They will talk about we the Kichwa community want to preserve the land, blah blah blah. And this statement will be in the newspaper. You know, in that way people will know their voice. You know, and trying to help them from bottom the bottom. Because usually what happens is we go to this in the UN where and nothing happens. Like that in mind that we need to go back to them and help them. And with this, um, I understand that it's not their way of organizing as a community, but in my my Kichwa thing it wasn't the same, it wasn't the same way. It's not like the bylaws or the but we create the bios. Who cares? The point here is that they they have to be able to navigate the system. They have to be ready. We cannot say to the system, you know what? This is not the way we do things. No. We have to get ready to talk in their terms. You have to understand what I'm trying to say. Uh, this is why I'm being, uh, okay. So this is, AIPP is a uh, formation that brings together different national organizations, uh, sub-national organizations, women's organization, youth organization in the different countries. However, the Secretariat is based here in Chiang So this is a different level. The Secretariat provides assistance. And one of the, so this is where the programs are. The programs are defined at the General Assembly. And then the Secretariat helps out source the, uh, try to source the needed resources for these programs. And then coordinates with the different members where it can be implemented. One of the big, one of the core problems of what is capacity building, as I said, and, and in Europe, right? Of course, the, the knowledge of the rights you know, is very low because many communities, okay, language, many, many indigenous communities are not familiar with the national language where, where laws are, uh, in which laws are written, yeah? language of, ins of instruction, language of the courts, language in the, in the, in the hospital. You know? And many of them are also physically remote from the political, economic, and communication centers. Yeah? So there is a need to be able to reach out to this. Of course, we cannot do it you know, massively, just us, where we work, wherever we can. So we train them on rights, okay? So we train them on documentation, monitoring, documentation, and reporting on rights. And then 
mentor and coach them along the way what they want. This is our role as at the secretariat level. So basically, they are driving the driving the process of their own empowerment. Um, my experience has been primarily with displaced indigenous peoples and uh, it's my sense that the younger generation are actually losing that sense of cultural identity. They tend to embrace Western culture, particularly American culture. And I guess my question is, do you sense that this is happening in the indigenous areas themselves? Thank you for raising that. Actually, that is a very, very big concern of the elders. We have a, we have a program on elders. Also, we have a program on youth. And so, that uh, we have been facilitating intergenerational dialogues also in the communities about this. And it's really a big concern. Even Uncle Johnny has already pointed out before in many conversations that he had. And this is actually the concern, especially of communities uh, that are being threatened for eviction because of the many development projects that are coming in. And the, the thing is that changes are happening so fast. Media is there, it's, you know, and you know, uh, even the thinking that you are a lesser person because you are not actually a mainstream guy, you don't speak the national language or anything. So these many of many influences actually are of course um, what is this? We, we cannot uh, we cannot also prevent this from you know entering the, 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 the communities in just communities. But that's it. The consciousness of the elders is there that they are afraid that with the loss of their land, particularly the loss of their, they will really also totally lose their identity. And this is spoken from um, indigenous communities, by indigenous communities who are weakly organized and, and, and not able actually to, to be able to have a systematic way of influencing their youth. First, because really the youth have to go to the community to study. They have to go to the community because there is no livelihood because the, the forests are now done and of course the youth does not want to do the traditional occupation uh, and then of course the, 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 the eviction that is happening in many communities in Sarawak in particular many communities really want to stay in their in their kampong you know, in their own uh, in their own communities but with the dam construction the plantations they are really forced forcefully so this concern is actually being raised. It's a very big concern for the for the elders and also for the leaders who really depend also on the you know the younger generation that they offer. I wonder if you could just speak to the impact of uh, religious and missionary uh, groups uh, in terms of uh, eroding or maintaining that Hmm, interesting question. <laughs> Actually, uh, yeah, indigenous, that's why we said that, you know, it's a colonization and assimilation, no? That's part of the human rights violation, actually, that has happened. And indigenous groups have different experiences. In India, for instance, Northeast India, the Philippines, we were colonized by um, the Christians. Uh, but we also retained actually our own identity. But there are certain um, religious groups who, um, who totally uh, you know, uh, demonized um, traditional beliefs and practices like the use of symbols. Yeah. So there is that uh, that uh, the tissue that comes out with, uh, with some of our communities. And the problem is uh, it's good if these communities are aware actually that you know
you know, uh, that they are not brainwashed, I would say, into thinking that, you know, their traditional community is pagan. The thing is, it's pagan, you know, the, 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 the labeling of it being pagan and it being pagan is a, it's a same and very Christian <laughs> doctrine. That is what actually uh, bothers a lot of us. Also. But uh, where there are uh, religious intuitions, but there are also activists, religious activists like myself, we uh, we have some conversations. You know, we know the contribution of this region in terms of you know probably uh, having us educated, but but that we are not you know bound by the doctrines of this religion and the practice our culture and also to assert our identity. But that's it, I'm saying it's very mixed. But it's a very mixed one that the that, that issue is recognized. This is Azad from Bangladesh. We had um, a presentation round in the beginning, and Azad was still on the plane from Bangladesh, and now he's here. And he has tried to come to our conferences for many, many years, and I don't believe that you are here now. We, we met in 2006 in our conference that we had in Costa Rica at the UN-mandated Peace University in Costa Rica where he was studying. And we had our conference that is now here in 2006 in Costa Rica. So since 2006 you are trying to come and now it's 2014. So please tell us who you are. <laughs> I'm uh, you can call me Azad. The full name is Muhammad Abdul Kalam Azad. I'm working with a private university as a faculty member, senior lecturer. And uh, uh, my university name is Manarat International University. So I was trying to actually join this conference and there was some problem. So last of all, I managed to come here. And uh, thank you. So I missed the presentation first part, but I saw few photos in here regarding Bangladesh uh, and uh, so I because I'm from Bangladesh so I, I know a little bit about it so I'd like to share some things with you. Uh, indigenous and tribals. This is the two term you will use maybe uh, or also we have here in our society like some people would like to say no they are they are tribals because indigenous, uh, actually uh, the people who have been recognized as indigenous people, uh, they have been migrated from Tripura and Myanmar, uh, the history says. So some peoples in our country, uh, they want to say, no, they are a tribe, tribals, they have their own identity, own culture, and uh, own life as well. So, they can uh, um, do it, but they are not indigenous in a sense. Uh, but Bangladeshi people, Bangali, they call themselves, say, we are indigenous. So there is a conflict between the two, using these terms in there. Uh, uh, so they would like to accommodate them, uh, yeah, we all are Bangladeshi, but they're tribals, they have different cultures, and Bangladeshi people have different cultures, but we would like to have a same identity like we are Bangladesh, being a citizen of Bangladesh, to minimize the conflict. But some peoples also, some scholars, are not, they are the indigenous, they are original people of the country. So this issue actually makes some problems uh, in our society. And uh, I saw some uh, photos in here about the well, I mean, protesting about uh, rape uh, and other things. Actually, this has happened, uh, really, because uh, there are Bengali settlers. And uh, because there is also, I mean, what's called a community who like to preserve uh, their rights and uh, their, uh, I mean, what's called is uh, arm, use arms to protect their rights. So, these 
uh, I mean, conflict, I mean, make problem with the two communities, Bangladeshi and another is, I mean, tribal or in, in, indigenous people. So, to take the actions or to take the ravings as both party and it's to the rape, and it's not only indigenous, I will say, also Bangladeshi people also sometimes rape by this, I mean, I mean, what's called indigenous people. Or, so, how we can, I mean, from to being a Bangladesh uh, people, so what do you suggest? What is your suggestion? How we can approach this issue uh, to minimize uh, this conflict and to live harmoniously, peacefully uh, with Bangladesh and, uh, and indigenous or tribes? Whatever you would like to say. Okay, thank you. Thank you for your sharing. Uh, I think your request of how we should approach this is too big a question for me to respond to. You have already mentioned uh, some of the historical facts that make it extremely difficult that even the government of Bangladesh is able to. Probably what we have to consider is these nation states are new developments and also that they are political animals. They are political formations. These are not formations of people. So we have to disassociate being a citizen and being a people. Yeah? So, uh, because that is actually a big problem for many. That the fact that they cannot really disassociate themselves from being the citizen of a country and being a people. Or a tribe or a group specific. Ethnic, with a specific ethnic identity. Yeah? So, the fact that they are not, for instance, I don't speak for them, but I think the issue is that they are not saying that they are not Bangladesh. Yeah? But what they are asserting is they are the distinct people with a distinct territory, and that they wish to transfer this distinct uh, identity to, gener to the next generations and within their own territory. So, Probably, what we need is a world, what is this, world dignity um, initiative among all peoples to really break certain notions that we have, such that certain peoples have less rights, yeah? and that we have to conform to a certain identity, and that we do not which does not respect diversity of identity, I would say. Yeah? So probably it's uh, starting from an individual because you're asking for a bunch of beginnings now. It's like, oh, too much. <laughs> I'm not a bad. <laughs> Sorry. So I think that's what I, I would like to just say about your, uh, your, um, your comment because it's, it's up also to the indigenous peoples in Bangladesh and the non-indigenous peoples in Bangladesh to be able to navigate, negotiate with each other, navigate the claim for, uh, you know, a, a, a more dignified life which respects human rights, and also to negotiate among themselves. Yeah. I don't know if this satisfies you, but that's my response. This is something different. Uh, I want to talk a little bit and. Is a question a bit. Something that's of interest to me is when I look at indigenous people, I would usually say an ethnic group, uh, and I try to see how that relates with a, a hegemony or a more dominant group. One of the things that I would reference is I would look back to my own um, experience of being with different ethnic groups and what helps to identify that group, not just within themselves but also externally. And part of that is symbols and part of that is language. Now, not all of those symbols I find are there. For example, if I take my own ethnic group, English, we don't have a national dress. There is no English national dress. We just don't have it. So when we relate to other groups, and they say, what's your national dress? We have to kind of go, mm, well, you know, people used to wear this, or, mm, well, maybe a bowler hat, but no, that's not really it. And we don't, we don't have an answer to it. And I find something similar, that's when I've, I've, I've talked to some people from, uh, hill tribes here in Thailand, 
For example, I talked to somebody from uh, a Hmong person, and I said, well, do you have a flag? Is there a Hmong flag? And the response was, no, we use a Thai flag, we're in Thailand now. And there was no real answer about, well, do you have any symbol? How would I recognize you? And I think that the thing that's most relevant to me is when I, when I look at something and there's writing and there's a dominant language, and the dominant language starts to erode that cultural identity so that the younger people find that they don't use that language. They don't have the registers or the words to say things. And I see that manifesting in all sorts of ways. For example, a business card that's only written in English or only written in English and Thai. And I'm saying, well, where's the other languages? Where's the other bit on there? And what I'm interested in is how can we work or is there a way that you think that we can work to give some of that media and those materials in a language that's done in a useful way. Uh, I went to a conference in Helsinki, which was done for the Finno Ugaric peoples, and we had many people coming from across the um, Russian Federation who are Finno Ugaric people who speak their own language and their own cultures. And the big issue they had is they wanted to produce or publish anything. Under Russian law, it had to be produced and published in Russian first. Well, when you're doing that with a small ethnic group that hasn't much money, do they want to do a publication or don't they want to do a publication? That's, that's the decider. So it's done in Russian. And then the materials just aren't there and the language isn't used. So what, what way can we do things to support the use of the indigenous languages in, throughout the media? So the written media and the um, video media and the online media. I, mean, I don't know what suggestions you might have for something. started with you and with a fantastic presentation with me, so thank you for that. That the comments are actually sharing very different perspectives on the topic. I mean, radically different. I think there haven't been two people who come from the same perspective of all the people who commented here. It starts from, there is a perspective which is a grassroots activism that is an insider's one, there is the mainstream one who looks at the uh, indigenous or the ethnic, there is one that uh, defines a country, is an ethnicity, uh, there is a political, there is an overarching, and we are trying to have a dialogue, and our starting points are so amazingly different that we seem to converse, but I don't think we are conversing actually at all, I think we are sharing how different such a loaded topic is, and we are all socialized to how to examine it, how to treat it, how we perceive it, and that's what we are sharing, and we are using terminology which we don't even share, we don't really agree upon, and definitely not our points of view, and I think that that alone is actually what the conference is about. So I just wanted to share this perspective. to tell you that I was profoundly impressed by your presentation. I want to thank you so much for coming here. You know, we have not met before, so I'm profoundly thankful for what you have brought to us. And uh, I think uh, we, we, we need you globally. We need you. And now comes my comment or my question. As you said, uh, I noticed that too, that the perspectives are so diverse here in this room, which is wonderful. And um, you know, when perspectives are di diverse, sometimes images are helping. So I was thinking of Catherine Odora Hoppers. She's from Uganda, and she is now a professor in South Africa. I spent six weeks with her just in uh, June and my, May, and she's mandated by the South African government to reform the university system in South Africa. 
and um, she made the following image. She made the following image, and uh, when you spoke about the different uh, perspectives, I was thinking of her image. She says, uh, like in Africa, the black people are try to be free from colonization, and it's a fight here, but we forget that we all will be eaten by the crocodile. And I think this is the situation. When we talk here, and we forgot, forget that, that is the problem. It's not enough to speak here. And uh, my question to you, Bernice, is, uh, to me, it's not that here some indigenous peoples need their rights. It's not enough. Um, because the entire context is toxic. So it's not a question of indigenous rights. It's the question of us, the human family, surviving. And who is, who are the people who have the knowledge of how to survive sustainably? The indigenous peoples. So it's not about them, it's about the entire human family. At the moment, we are in the mouth of the crocodile, all of us. So how can the indigenous peoples not just save themselves, they have to save the planet, they have to save the human family on this planet. Yeah, um, thank you. That's, I just want to um, reflect on the fact that in, the, in many of the pronouncements of indigenous peoples, they are not saying that let, let's save the indigenous peoples, help us so that we will be saved for our own sake. What they have always been saying is that we have something to contribute to humanity and all of this and give us a chance to contribute to humanity by not destroying us. That actually is the message of many indigenous peoples worldwide. And thus, that is captured. Yeah, let's look at the big picture. The destruction of our territories, which may be the lungs of certain bio, bio physical area, is contributing to a bigger, uh, for instance, uh, uh, the, the bigger atmosphere. The, the, the non the for instance, the, the non-destruction of our lands through mining is going to also benefit, for instance, the people downstream yeah. for the resources of the future when probably technology will be developed in a more sustainable way or where, when there are more conversations on how to develop all these resources in a more uh, sustainable way that is more, more self-determined by those who actually should benefit. So this is what the messages are. We are not fighting for ourselves. We are not fighting only for our rights. But as we fight for our rights, we also fight for the rights of a bigger, the bigger uh, human race, the, the human race, the bigger environment. Thus, we should be in all of this in solidarity, as we also would be in solidarity with the struggles of the different communities, in the struggles of the different sectors. Yeah. So, I don't know if that answers your question, but I think that is the message that we are one to put across. We are not fighting for our own, own selfish or you know, parochial interest, but actually what we're saying that by helping us fight against uh, the destruction of our territories, by the, by, uh, against the violation of our rights, by helping us promote protect our rights, we are actually in this all together to be able to, for humanity to cope with whatever changes we have in the future. Yeah. I have uh, one more question for you. Um, I think here the term indigenous peoples, it, in some ways it kind of 
feels like a, an isolationist term in a way. It makes me feel like there's me and there's them when we're all sort of indigenous to, to planet Earth. However, in this context, could you please define for us the, the difference, between, if there is a difference between indigenous and tribal? This is something I, I still really like to know. As, as we, uh, how's it during you? We do not want to define, we just want to characterize indigenous peoples. But at the same time, there are different societies, different governments, different uh, academic institutions, different donors refer to, 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 I mean, use different terms. So let's not look at the term. Let us look at the essence of the, uh, the group. So I would like us to go back always to, you know, historical uh, connection, territorial definition, identity, distinct identity, the will to preserve and propagate this kind of identity and self-identification. They may not, they may call them some tribals, that's okay. Yeah, because at least what they're familiar with. They may call themselves the, the very uh, term that they only that they, they only know. So I think we uh, it's better to focus on the, you know the, the essence of the group identity. Right. Um, I don't use the word uh, tribe anymore. I still like highland community. So it's like here in, in in Thailand, it's not like oh the hill tribe people up there. It's sort of like derogatory in nature, like they. Like they're somehow lesser I and mean, really they're like the giants. Yeah. But um, so that's what I mean, he'll try versus the uh, So for instance in Thailand, no? the, the national, uh, the, the network of indigenous peoples in Thailand actually also uh, came out with a statement that they would be preferred to be called indigenous peoples. Yeah. So that's, uh, I mean, uh, it also depends on the degree of organization or the degree of strength of these indigenous peoples to actually self-identify that you, you can also appreciate, you know, uh, their, their, their being indigenous. Are, are, the, are the Highland communities in Northern Thailand, I mean, are they tribes or is it, it's like, you know, it's like, a loaded term. Can, you know, I think that's a loaded term, you know, I mean, as I said, Probably let's not let's not deal on the terms because probably uh, an anthropologist will tell you a different thing. A sociologist, you know, the, the, these are terms. So probably let's look at the characterization. Yeah. I also have a question about terminology and what you're talking about in order to understand this problem. Are you saying that an indigenous person? is a person who lives on the land in question. Or, or, let me ask a question. If I came from a place, but I then went to college in Australia, and then I now live in Seattle, Washington, and I am married to someone from a different culture, Am I not, am I still an indigenous person? Uh, where is my where where is an indigenous person? Is that's my question. Okay. Uh, that's tricky because uh, different ethnic indigenous peoples would have um, different ways of actually identifying who are the members of their of their of their people. Yeah. For instance, uh, the indigenous peoples in the Philippines, especially the called collectively Igorots, but Igorot is a generic term for the indigenous peoples in uh, northern Philippines, in a section of northern Philippines. But they have, and they are composed of different peoples. But this group, when they are out, they will identify themselves as Igorots. And Igorots, if you say Igorots in the Philippines, they are indigenous. So they have different organizations all over the world. And they call themselves Igorots. 
and they are indigenous because they identify themselves as Igorots. They are indigenous to the Philippines. But this is a tricky question because there are certain, certain, well, this is uh, certain uh, groups who would say that no, you are already out of the territory, so you are not considered indigenous. So uh, it's up to the group, no? Thank you so much. Um, I have a question uh, based on my experiences in uh, the upper rivers in Borneo, Rajan. Uh, when I came there, about the site where they were going to build a big dam and the people were going to relocate it. And so they tell me, uh, welcome to us, but we are not worthy of your visit because we are the apes living in the trees. So the, the, my question is, how do you also find that it's a question of losing their dignity due to the government's description of themselves as inferior people? Do you find this universally and how can we approach this issue? That is... Uh, yeah. uh, that is uh, what we are finding among our, our, ourselves, no, in, 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 for instance, uh, among the members and partners of AP. It's really, they will, uh, for instance, the, 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 the term used here in Thailand is Yeah, and, and, there, uh, and there is like a resistance to that, no? So they have defined it in ter themselves in a different, in a, uh, with a different term, uh, I'm sure. That proceed. Okay, so that, yeah, that's true. And that is also, but there is also like in Bangladesh, uh, the term Juma is collectively used for the Suchitabun uh, Hill Trust. And at some point it, might, it was derogatory. But they have taken this term as a rallying point, as a, a rallying point to identify more uh, like them as a collective. Because the Juma would refer to different peoples also, like Igor, no? So these are things that will be, what is this, um, can only be claimed or, you know, promoted or accepted by, by, by to whom they are referred to. In Cambodia, if we are, if we have been tracking them, the term Bunong, which is actually one people in Ratanakiri, is derogatory in Khmer. It is like you're a primitive, you're uneducated, you're savage, like that. And the king, the, the, the former king, the, uh, actually um, legislated, uh, had a legislation made to, to, uh, to, um, to delegitimize this you know, term, and it should not be used. But one politician in the last year or the other year used this to shame another politician and it became an issue. So that if the, these Bunong people uh, engaged this uh, politician uh, on, on that term and it was an opportunity to educate actually everybody. So I think uh, it's, you know, it's up to uh, the, the people themselves to be able to uh, really tell us uh, what would be more, what would be wanted. Does that satisfy you? Um, I, I think we do need to address the question of the crocodile. I'm very pleased that Evelyn brought up the, uh, the, the metaphor here of the crocodile because I think in many ways we do need to tackle it from that direction. We need to be looking at the macro environment. We need to be looking at the way capitalism is working at the moment to the benefit of the developed countries of the West and to the disadvantage of those in developing countries and particularly the indigenous groups. So I, I think we, maybe it's outside our remit here today, but I do think that that actually is the answer um, in the long term. We need some kind of international um, structure 
which would uh, create a greater sense of justice and dignity in the world because at the end of the day, we are all fighting for resources, unfortunately, and that's what we need to focus on. Just an observation, really. Well, thank you for the very informative presentation and responses to the Q&A. Um, thank you also for the very important uh, work you're doing, the organization is doing on behalf of Indigenous peoples. I have a question that would like to, I'd like to take it to the global level and back to the grassroots level. <clears throat> I'm asking you specifically about what, what action your organization uh, is taking. Um, it's only recently that uh, people in advanced capitalist countries, whether in Japan or the United States, have come to protest against World Bank policies, a uh, critique of the so-called development policies. In fact, that language uh, used by NGOs of sustainable development, indigenous people's rights, uh, human rights, women's rights, uh, uh, bottom-up decision-making, uh, uh, participation, etc., has been co-opted by these organizations. Um, and so you mentioned uh, ASEAN, uh, the Free Trade and Investment Plan, uh, and uh, I would imagine the Asian Development Bank would fall into the same boat. Um, is there, I mean, in, in Japan or the United States, is a very low level of awareness of the negative effects of development. Uh, development for whom, that question is often or, or hardly ever asked. Um, and, and her question, uh, talking about indigenous peoples in Ecuador, she mentioned that, uh, I'm sorry, I forgot, Mariana, uh, that uh, they have some access to the media. Uh, and I, I, would, I would assume that that was because, that that was because uh, of the president, Rafael Correa, is going to be supportive of indigenous peoples, right? I may be wrong. But uh, in, in Thailand, I, that, here's my question. Um, your organization, I assume you're working with other NGOs and other grassroots-based organizations in Cambodia and in other countries. Um, and, uh, and you have these affiliations. You're working with them and taking different direct actions with them. Do you have access to the media? Do you get this information, a critique of the development strategies that are being pushed from the top down that's supposed to benefit all of Thailand or Cambodia? Uh, do you get access to the media? And how do you get that information out to the public if you don't, don't have access to media? Actually, there's one thing I forgot to share with you. Recognizing the role of media and uh, to either, you know, uh, disempower and empower our communities. Uh, we have a new project called the Indigenous Voices in Asia, and there is a network, and this is composed of uh, uh, indigenous and non-indigenous media practitioners, both some in mainstream, some in alternative, some in the social media. And so uh, the, 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 their, their objective is really to be able to influence actually the, 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 the news, the images of, uh, that is coming out uh, of indigenous peoples. And um, definitely there is very much, but it's, uh, there is uh, not a good access that we have, but it also depends on the countries. For instance, in Nepal, they use a lot of media, and they have, they have also developed their own network. In the Philippines, they also did that. Uh, in Cambodia, they are growing. They are they are growing the, the network you know, and, and and the relations with media. In Thailand, there is a limited, but there are, they have friends in the. There are good. They have good friends actually in the media, in the media in mainstream media and also in the alternative. And that's why you can we we can read actually uh, some of the situations that are that are happening among uh, in the. In communities and so uh, this is an effort that is uh, that is ongoing and we hope that there will be more and that the network will be strengthened it will also widen it will also be able to really influence um, the, the, what is coming out about indigenous peoples Okay, thank you very much for your very good kind of information and um, um, well, uh, 
exchange or discuss about religious people in Asia overall. So let me take this opportunity uh, for a few minutes to to add another role of mine as a moderator, but as a mom and indigenous person here in Thailand as well, because you are here and you will be here for next four or five days and especially on the, on the third day you are going to be in the village as well so you will see many things here but um, most of you I doubt that you may not familiar, you may not know about the history, the problems of the new tribes or indigenous people in, here so I would like to add some information before you li listen to um, what other Johnny's presentation, or Jeff's, or uh, Victoria's presentation in this afternoon as well. Here in Northern Thailand, um, previously we have kind of lowland people who are also diverse in terms of ethnic background. Right? And also the upland people who are diverse in terms of ethnic backgrounds as well. So um, that's why since the end of the Second World War and the start of the, the beginning of the Cold War period, the Highland people then being well, um, kind of paying, paying, paying attention by the national government and international uh, countries or organizations as well, because first, to the perspective of the Thai national government and the foreign experts. These Highland peoples are new immigrants into China. But indeed, not all of them just has recently migrated into China. Many of them are the native people, indigenous people here for centuries, even before the Thai Lowland Thai people as well. For example, the current or the lower people who are native to this area for uh, centuries. So since late 1950s to early 1960s, the Thai government and international countries then pay attention to them because of first the problem of what um, communism um, movement, which came from the former Soviet Union to China, Vietnam, Laos, and then Thailand here in the Northern Partner. Second is that the problem of opium, uh, opium use in Western countries, because these huge tribes people, some groups of them cultivate opium, and then the opium then being refined to be heroin and the export to the Western countries. Indeed, the legacy of new opium is the colonial, the colonial regime, right? But later on, the problems then um, caused not only to the island people, but also the lowland people and Western countries as well. So that's why in early 1960s, the government didn't pay attention to them. And then the term that they refer to these variety groups of island people is Huge trap. I think this is the uh, term that adopted from the colonial government, the British, uh, working among the people in Northeast India, Burma, and also Northern Thailand. So this is a broad category, category of huge traps, but indeed uh, they call they, they themselves in different names. So that's why development is being brought to them in order to solve the problem of opium cultivation among them, to eradicate opium cultivation by introducing cash crops to them. Right. So up to the present, the long well, period of highland development among the highland people, yes, on one side, they are benefit from this um, in terms of get rid of poverty or problems of drugs or opium cultivation, but 
the more the, the less success, the more they involve it in development, the more they lose their own ethnic identity. Some already mentioned on this. The more they are integrated, the more they are assimilated to be the Thai national identity. So that's why starting in the late 1980s, early 1990s, the young generations of them, together with the elders like Johnny, they form their own organizations, no matter ethnic organizations or kind of mix or inter-ethnic organizations, what they call NGOs, and then work among themselves. And then also, they also got opportunity to join with international NGOs from the Philippines, Malaysia, or other countries. So that's now, they have, in Thailand itself, starting with the, the young leaders of the new tribes people, they form their own networks of indigenous people in Thailand. And then they start to join the United Nations celebration on rural indigenous peoples. Uh, they started in 2007. It was the first year that the indigenous people here in Thailand start to celebrate the rural indigenous peoples day here in Chiang Mai. And then in that year, there are about 20 plus groups. Mostly they are the Highland indigenous people. And later on, we found that after five, six, six seven years, there are more and more lowland ethnic groups in northern Thailand, northeastern part, central, southern Thailand also join. Last year, we have about 55 groups. So that's why they kind of choose the term both indigenous and ethnic groups. What they call the network of indigenous and ethnic groups in Thailand as a movement. So this is the um, situation of the ethnic groups in Thailand, starting with the Hill tribes or the island ethnic groups, and then they try to um, define themselves not huge tracks, but indigenous and ethnic groups. So you will learn more in this afternoon and in the village, and then we we'll come back we can talk more about this as well. Yeah, so that's all I would like to say now. But uh, lunch is ready outside, right? so we will have about almost an hour for lunch, and then come back here in the room at 1 o'clock. So you can take your foods and then bring to me inside this room as well. Thank you very much for your attention.